Welcome to Adventures in Accessibility, a podcast that explores the far reaches of disability, access, and inclusion with your host, Emily Schumann. Welcome back, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Today's guest is our very own Chris Murphy. Chris grew up having a disability, but not understanding that it was a disability. He wasn't allowed to participate in sports as a child, but was able to pursue music, taking up the trombone at age 12. Chris majored in trombone performance at California State University, Fullerton, and earned a Bachelor's of Music in 2002. He lived as a freelance musician in Southern California, having the opportunity to perform in multiple genres of music, including being a musician at Disneyland between 2007 and 2012. It was during this period that Chris began riding a bike as a commuter and began finding enjoyment in exercise. He inadvertently learned about paracycling while researching symptoms of overuse he began having on his unaffected arm. At that time, Chris began to understand that the medical condition he had all his life was a disability. Chris pursued paracycling, which brought him to college. Colorado to train at the Olympic and Paralympic Training Center, eventually participating in two Paralympic Games. He earned nine world-level medals, including two gold medals, and broke a world record two times. He also won around 30 national championships and did all of that in a 10-year period. Chris has worked at the Rocky Mountain ADA Center as an information specialist since 2017 and is now full-time taking on a new role as knowledge translation specialist. All right. Well, hi, Chris. Thanks so much for being on our podcast. We're really excited to have you. Thank you, Emily. I'm excited to be on here. Yeah. And full disclosure for the listener, we know Chris Murphy. He's one of the staff members of the Rocky Mountain ADA Center, but he has a really impressive athletic career, as you just heard from his biography. So um, we're excited to talk to him more and learn more about him. And so, Chris, my first question for you is, what can you share with us about your disability and how it informs what you do? So my disability, it's uh, not necessarily the most well-known. Um, it's called Herb's palsy. It could also be called um, obstetric brachial plexus injury. Basically, what that means is that it was a birth injury to the nerves that run into uh, my left arm um, as a child or during birth. So it was a result of a traumatic birth. Pretty much all I know as far as just how to interact um, with everyday life. And have you always kind of identified with the label of person with a disability, or is that something that came about for you later in life? So that came about quite a bit later in life. My parents were kind of kept in the dark about the extent to my condition. My understanding is that they were told that it would just get better on its own, and of course it it didn't. So essentially, they just kind of treated me like no different. Essentially, I, I grew up very much the same. In other ways, not so much. I didn't know it at the time, but like my mom wouldn't let me go out and do sports, for example, because she just thought... I wouldn't be able to do well or hurt myself because my arm didn't function well. Since it's all I knew, I didn't really have anything to compare it to. So I just literally thought that, you know, how people are left and right-handed. I just thought I was extremely right-handed, you know. So with my left arm just not functioning very well, it, it didn't really trigger anything in my thought process because, you know, that's really all I knew. I just I had my compensations that I did that were just perfectly normal to me. I never really compared myself to others as a kid. So it didn't really um, occur to me until even that it had a name until I was about 16 years old. And my dad, um, he was actually trying to prepare me for the future and, you know, mentioning the possibility of, you know, if there was ever a draft into the military to remember the phrase herbs palsy. And that's the first time I'd ever heard of that. All of a sudden the thing had a name, but it didn't really mean anything to me at that moment. I was just like, okay, that's uh, it's an interesting piece of information. But what about living my life? And it really wasn't until way late in life that I started getting involved in the paracycling program, once I even understood that I could even do that, that uh, that I was a person with disability. So it took quite a bit of time in my life, at least I want to say at that time, I was probably close to 30 before I started um, identifying as a person with a disability. 
Mm -hmm. And do you think that having that upbringing of where it wasn't really acknowledged and you weren't kind of given any, you know, special treatment or disparate treatment because of your disability, do you think that helped you overall or do you think it hindered you in any way? I don't think it hindered me. If it helped me, probably. I mean, one thing I've realized is like, at least with the the small community of people that I've met with the same condition, we all kind of have a similar story in that we just didn't know anybody that ever, you know, was similar to us. And it was just always kind of our thing to bear, our burden to bear. And nobody really understood what I was going through in a daily life. You know, obviously my parents had some understanding, but without actually having the limitations that I have, they couldn't really understand. But I think for the most part, it was a benefit just because it helped me um, just be very adaptable into society, you know, and just um, it gave me a lifetime of experience to just go immediately to figuring out how to do something that might not be straightforward instead of potentially giving myself um, a pass and saying, oh, I can't do that because of this, you know, or that. Um, I've learned that I do need to I do need to not be so stubborn and uh, give it a pass every once in a while because just the nature of trying to do certain things um, when part of your body isn't very functional um, it, it adds up cumulatively with uh, overuse injuries and um, so that's just something I've had to learn to but it's okay uh, later in life mm-hmm. and by that you mean like the overuse of the other arm. So since my left arm that's affected, my right arm is lately unaffected, and I definitely use my right arm to do most daily things in life. Since I've been aware of this condition in more detail, and that was around maybe when I was 23, 24, it was after college. Um, I was just starting to get into bike riding at that time, also having some overuse injuries for the first time in my right shoulder. I could just hear the joint moving around as I were moving my shoulder, and I thought, oh, that's probably not a good thing. So I just started looking stuff up on the internet about herbs palsy, that phrase I'd learned from my dad, and uh, just kind of diving into that a little bit more um, just because of having those uh, beginnings of overuse injuries. And it's something that I still deal with. Maybe like every six months, something happens, um, you know, where I I try to open a door and then it's like, oh, wow, that was excruciatingly painful. Oh, I better get that looked at, you know. Uh, But the next time uh, it won't be that. It'll be like, oh, my shoulder really hurts today. Uh, like the front of my shoulder another six months goes by and it's like oh the back of my shoulder is doing something weird i better get that looked at so it's just a a balancing act um of trying to be aware of that kind of stuff do any sort of physical therapy stuff that's good for me and just to force myself to use my left arm as often as possible to just kind of spare my right arm from you know the all the accumulated mileage it has So since you didn't think of yourself as disabled until later in life, you know, when did you actually first learn about the Americans with Disabilities Act and, you know, how do you interact with it today? I didn't learn about the ADA until quite a bit later in life. I think I was at that time an athlete at the Olympic Training Center. And I think actually my first interaction with the ADA Center was with the ADA's 25th anniversary. They had a special event at the training center, and I think I was hired as an athlete to interact with the staff. So I had met some people there that I'd later on get to work with that time, but didn't really understand it. I mean, I think I had about the same understanding as just, as a lot of people do uh, that all into our center, which is um, a very vague idea that it exists, but doesn't didn't really know how it impacted my life or whatnot. It's something that, as I've learned about it, I can think back to situations where I was like, oh, wow, I really wish I knew more about employment rights under the ADA when I was working at Disneyland as a musician, for example. This was before my cycling career, and I was working there as a uh, as a musician on the substitute musician list. So anybody that called uh, or any, any of the regular musicians that needed a day off for whatever reason would just have a list of people to go through that were already cleared and trained um, to substitute for them. So I, I did that for a few years after college. And it was difficult for me because as a not full-time employee, I didn't have to uh, the expectation to memorize the music book. Um, and that's a pretty substantial 
music but that the regulars they just have it memorized and they play through it you know once a week so it's pretty easy to stay on top of it but for me um that wasn't the expectation and we had to essentially just attach this book to our instruments so that we can go out to the park and play the part and this book because it had maybe like 50 songs in it it's pretty heavy and with the trombone you hold it in your left arm um with that extra weight yeah, it really impacted my ability to just perform well. It was just more weight than my left arm could handle. And like, I remember one day specifically, my left arm was just shaking because of the weight and I was just not sounding very good. Um, had I known about my rights under the ADA, I could have just asked, you know, can I, can you tell me the set list before we go out there? So I know what five or six songs to pull up instead of having to pull out this 50 song brick. That should have been very easily accommodated and uh, not much trouble. And, uh, but I, like, I honestly just didn't know I had that right at that time. Yeah, that was just a very uh, pivotal moment for me. It, it's actually part of why I fell out of love with being a musician is just having some certain um, situations and experiences where I could just see a ceiling to um, my potential. And, um, you know, it wasn't the whole thing. There are other things that uh, maybe not love being a musician for a living, but that was one of the big things that sticks out of my mind as far as uh, how it relates to the ADA. Um, now, it's just interesting because I do physical access at the center. So I just, anytime I go anywhere, I just kind of see the ADA at work or not, you know, and I kind of figure out, well, that's not. Good. You know, it's almost a challenge to go around and figure out, okay, what can I find that's not compliant? Um, and most of the time I can within a few minutes. When I can't, I'm very impressed and like and it makes me happy. It's like, okay, someone's doing the job. That's excellent. And then there are other times where, you know, there are just certain little things like door maneuvering clearances that they just have a trash can there. So sometimes I just like move the trash can to the best place to, you know, maintain that clearance so that people can get out if they need to. <laughs> and I just hope that people that work, they just kind of catch on. I don't know if it works or not, but I do that. But yeah. I mean, I, I do have an appreciation of certain aspects of the ADA, the uh, operable parts steps, especially um, the operable parts within the ADA standards require that operable parts be uh, one hand operable and not requiring twist uh, tight pinching, grasping or twisting of the wrist. With my left arm, I can't really twist my wrist. So like round doorknobs are basically useless to me. Um, and having a plethora of options in the in the real world when I just go out in society um, that I can actually deal with is really nice. And I didn't appreciate that until I learned about that. But now it's something that every time I do see that, it, I do appreciate it. And I mean, I utilize it too, because I, I get going back to the overuse stuff. I just, I really need to make an effort to preserve my right arm as much as possible and use my left as much as I can. So the ability to just open a bathroom door with my left hand and not ha have it be an issue is something that directly impacts my long-term health. And I think it makes a good point about like, you know, some of these ADA standards seem like frivolous or, you know, people don't mm -hmm. understand why they're there. But for you, this is something that makes a big difference in your life. Oh, definitely. Uh, definitely. And just like a lot, there's like a lot of things. It's it's not important to you until it's important to you. You know, um, there's a lot of that with the ADA that I've learned. So during your athletic career, you know, as a Paralympian, I know you've traveled all over the globe. So I'm curious to know kind of, you know, in America, what are some accessibility challenges you face or people you know face and um, particularly how that compares to some of the other countries you've visited? Yeah, that's a really interesting one in that I don't necessarily face a ton of barriers out in the world, um, but being on the Paralympic team, I have a lot of teammates with various disabilities and I could definitely uh, empathize with them as I was traveling with them and just kind of seeing the difficulties that they have. Um, so I can speak about that to an extent. I think the biggest barrier in the U.S. Um, that I could identify is probably attitudinal. Um, where people just make decisions that directly impact people with disabilities and they're mostly just being inconsiderate. And it's things like, you know, at the airport, just how just mistreating people's wheelchairs. So it's a huge one amongst my friends. And I, I don't think that anybody that works for airlines is going to work thinking, I really want to destroy a wheelchair today. They're just not 
being considered whatsoever. They're just going, okay, whatever. I don't care. I'm phoning it in. I'm not going to put myself in the shoes of the person who has this device and, uh, you know, act accordingly and act like my life experience depended on this thing that's in my hand. So that's probably the biggest thing amongst my peers that I've noticed, uh, one of the biggest issues. But abroad, it's very interesting. Um I always felt like, at least where I've traveled, attitudinal barriers were far less. People were generally a lot more considerate of people with disabilities. Um, but the drawback, though, is that at least in Europe, that a lot of Europe is just, it's old. Facilities that are hundreds of years old were so just not designed to be accessible, you know, and that includes cobblestone rights of way and stuff like that. And one of the primary differences, though, between the U.S. and Europe, at least, is that the Europeans generally have an idea of how difficult the world is, the physical built world is for people with disabilities. And they try to make up for it whenever they can um, with policies that go beyond just equity like we have in the ADA. An example is uh, at the Van Gogh Museum. There's usually a really long line to get into it. But if you have a disability, um, you can just, you know, go up to the ticket window and they'll just let you through without having to stand in the line. That's just one of the ways that they feel try to make up for the just general inaccessibility to even get to the Van Gogh Museum. They kind of understand that it's a struggle to get there. Let's not make them, you know, also wait in these horrible lines. Other places were very interesting, too, and places that you might not expect. Like, one thing that struck me about Brazil when I went down there the second time is that I just walked to, like, a shopping mall across the street from our hotel, and I noticed that they had designated travel lanes within the parking lot for uh, people with disabilities. It was, you know, it was marked with a painted um, blue line and with the international symbol of accessibility in it, and it was really just, um, it was a travel lane designated for people with disabilities uh, to get from their cars to the shopping mall. Um, and it was just interesting just to see that and have um, to see other like drivers in the parking lot respect that, you know, that's what that's for. I mean, give people with disability a little bit more room um, to maneuver and just feel safe. And that was just something that struck me in a country like Brazil, which, you know, you always hear like new things about um, corruption and the government and things like that. And, you know, Brazil is just a wild place because some of it is just like the United States and some of it is like the wild, wild west. It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's some just very impoverished, uh, lawless areas, but that's still a system that they recognize um, a need for, a heightened need for people with disabilities, and they provide that. And it's just interesting to see that society, you know, kind of go above and beyond what the U.S. requires in a way. Yeah, that's an interesting experience to have traveled the world with sort of an accessibility lens kind of evaluating how those countries are, are treating that. Mm -hmm. So what's the work that you do or the achievement that you have that you're most proud of and most passionate about? Uh, would that be uh, within cycling or just in general? Yeah, in general. I mean, I'd love to know both within cycling and in general. It's kind of funny. I didn't really think about it as I was going, but once I finished my career, I kind of looked back and thought like, oh yeah, I kind of did kind of a lot, didn't I? Part of me with cycling was just trying to push the sport itself. Um, obviously I wanted results and I got some results, but I felt like I was very integral into elevating the standard of the sport and if looking back on the sport and just even seeing how fast the times have gotten, um, in my category and just knowing that I played a pivotal part in pushing that envelope, that makes me probably the most proud to look back on that aspect of competing in cycling. Um, but I also like, um, I just really enjoy finding myself right now enjoying um, helping others get involved in it. You know, anything that people love um, to do, I feel like they should be able to do it. And I, when I started, I benefited quite a bit from other people that were there before me, helping me get integrated into the sport, either with, you know, giving me advice on how to pace a certain race or um, letting me borrow certain equipment that was too expensive for me at the time so that I can just even be competing against them. But, but these people were just cool enough that they just let me do that. Um, and I found myself trying to give back as well as I could, as I can to that. And I'm really happy about that myself. I, I just actually gave a 
the 17 year old kid who's really good at cycling um i gave him my old time trial bike so he can just get a head start to get into the sport i'm really looking forward to seeing what he does there so that that might be another thing that i can look back and be super proud of and like yeah i got that kid started i think he's gonna i personally think he's gonna be a superstar so he has a very similar functional disability to me so my bike was perfect for him it's basically set up for him already and then in general i don't know i i just really like the people that i've gotten to be teammates and friends with and work with every one of them has had like a really big impact on my development and just being able to interact with these people i think that probably means the most to me as a general highlight that's great i love that you're able to kind of take on a mentorship role now in your retirement from paralympics yeah i I didn't really anticipate that but it you know, when the opportunity comes, it's really nice to be able to do something about it. And, you know, just be like, yeah, let's pass this forward. So. So what would you like listeners to know about accessibility for people with disabilities? Access is something that's very important when it's important to the person. I talk to a lot of people that, you know, roll their eyes a little bit on having to account for accessibility because it takes a little bit more effort. But the thing about that is it's like when you have a responsibility to provide accessibility, it's generally a one-time thing. You know, it's making a, a toilet um, accessible at a restaurant if you own it. Um, it's, um, you know, modifying a policy that, you know, the policy itself it screens out someone with a disability, but if you just modify the way you do things, then that all of a sudden that person can participate. They're usually just one-off things um, for the person with the responsibility, but the person who needs the access is going everywhere in their life and not finding it. So it's something that they have to deal with pretty much all the time, every day. So as annoyed as someone could be for having to have a responsibility to provide accessibility, it just doesn't compare at all to the real lives of people living with disabilities. And one question I like to ask all of our guests and, you know, particularly interested in your thoughts, because I know as an athlete, you know, you have to overcome a lot of setbacks and things like that. So what would you say to listeners who are feeling defeated right now, either because of a personal struggle or because of some current events? Um, I would just say it's not your fault. Don't internalize it. I mean, things are the way they are. And sometimes you know, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes it sucks, um, but things are the way they are. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have to internalize the way that things are, you know. So myself, um, I, I definitely see myself as a person with a disability now, but I don't feel disabled, um, if that makes sense. Um, you know, I, I just have a unique way of navigating the world sometimes based off of just functional limitation. Um, but I don't let that make me depressed anymore. Um, I, I will say that I have had very negative um, experiences with mental health in the past, partly due to my disability. But that was just when I didn't really understand the bigger picture. And I didn't realize that I had the power to not accept certain things, certain judgments about myself. Um, so I would just encourage people that do feel frustrated just to stick with it because everything does pass at some time or another. There's very few things that are just stuck the way they are, and everything that's worth doing um, is worth holding on to the effort to accomplish, whether it can be done easily or not. So it's a little easier said than done, but I mean, I just feel like I've been through it, and I feel like understanding and looking back, that's probably the most important thing I could just let somebody know based off of some of the experiences that I've had. That's really good advice. So if a listener wanted to connect with you after today's episode, you know, where can they find you? And, you know, do you have any specific calls to action for listeners today? As far as where to find me, I mean, you can always email me at work. I'm my work email address. I'll leave that here. It's chris.murphy at unco.edu. And um, I do have an Instagram. I forget what it is. I think it's at gofastmurph, M-E-R-P-H. So that's another way. I don't really post a lot there, but I do like a good meme uh, every once in a while. Uh, as far as call to action, I think the best thing that people can do or this anybody can do is just think of empathy as a skill that can be developed and just work on, you know, practice, practice it and get better at empathy through practicing it. And um, I just feel like the world in general would be a much 
better place if more people had empathy for other people. I don't think it's necessarily correct to think of it's something that you either have or you don't have. I think it's something that just gets stronger the more you exercise it. So something that I think follows pretty much every thread of life that I think could be improved um, could just be done with increased empathy. Well, as we wrap up today, Chris, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners or anything that we didn't ask that we should have? No, I think that's pretty much it for me. I just really appreciate the opportunity that that you gave me to get my uh, story out there. Yeah, absolutely. It's been great talking with you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Adventures in Accessibility. Tune in next time for another dive into the unknown. Adventures in Accessibility is hosted by Emily Schumann and Jessica Lucinia is our sound engineer. This podcast is a project of the Rocky Mountain ADA Center and is funded under a grant from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. Grant number 90DPAD0014. This production is intended solely for entertainment and informal guidance and should not be considered legal advice. The opinions expressed by guests are not necessarily held or in endorsed by the Rocky Mountain ADA Center.